All right, so uh, welcome to the new mayor's show. Um, we're revitalizing this after a, a hiatus of uh, pro probably about nine months. And uh, one of the things that we thought about with the, the, this show is that we don't have a good catchy name. So what I'd like to do is challenge everybody who's watching or listening to, to come up with a name for our show. Um, we've had a few ideas tossed around, getting to the point, what's the point, um, Mayor Mike presents, those sorts of things. So I'd be happy to hear from you. Let us know through uh, our Facebook page or you can email me here at City Hall. And what we'll do is we'll compile those suggested names and uh, take the top five or so, post them on our website, and we'll have a little voting session. And I'll pony up uh, a $10 gift certificate to one of the Stevens Point businesses or something, and the winner can grab that certificate. So help us name the show. With that, uh, we're going to move into the first segment. And uh, what I wanted to do today is focus a little bit on something that was kind of near and dear to me, even as an alderman, and that was ordinance control. Um, not just rental properties, but properties in general that uh, the owners are either not aware of, of some of the ordinances that we have, or maybe they're just downright irresponsible uh, and, and just unable uh, to, to maintain their property uh, as the ordinances say they should. So one of the things that I did uh, when I got into office is we created an ordinance control officer. And the reason we did that was because our inspection department was pretty busy most of the days doing construction insp uh, inspections and things like that. So we really only had an opportunity to address the ordinances um, on, on a complaint-based system. So unless we knew about it or drive, drove by and saw it, uh, things really didn't get as addressed as much as I thought they should. So with that, we created uh, the Ordinance Control Officer position, and with me here today is the person who's filled that position, Dan Trelka. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, so I know this was a new position. You kind of walked into this position uh, without someone to, to follow in the footsteps of, so to speak, and uh, kind of give me an idea of, of how things started and, and what you do on a daily basis. Well, I have a background um, in law enforcement. I was a sheriff's deputy for Juneau County for three and a half months, and I worked for the town of Grand Rapids as a police officer part-time for another three and a half months or so. Um, so my background in law enforcement kind of gave me the overall um, training and knowledge that I would need to read and interpret the ordinances as they were intended to be interpreted. Um, that being said, I've also gone through a training program with Jim Zepp. He's our building administrator, our building inspector, and our zoning administrator, sure. and um, the director of community development, Michael Ostrowski, as well. Um, that was about a week's worth of training uh, to help clarify some of the ordinances that are currently on the books. Uh, a typical day for me, I guess, you know, only being part time, I come in, uh, answer the emails first, usually. Um, some matters are more pressing than others, and I want to make sure those get dealt with. Right. Uh, I'll then go through and um, respond to phone calls if people are calling with questions or, you know, wondering why somebody's getting a violation and their neighbor next to them is not. Um, our process is, is basically we have to observe the complaint before we can do anything. Right. And I know you take pictures right. uh, of the violations as well because maybe it's only happening for one day and that's one thing I wanted to stress too is that you know we're, we're trying to do this universally treating everybody exactly the same uh, we obviously won't have eyes on every piece of property every minute of every day uh, but as these things are observed uh, you take photos of the violation so when you send that letter uh, just notifying them that hey this is a violation maybe you didn't know about it uh, you know it's not like we go in and slap a fine on someone uh, the, the moment we see something that happens right so talk a little bit about that so our process is is obviously we see the uh, the violation uh, we take the photograph we open a system case mm -hmm. um, a letter is automatically generated we plug in some uh, generic uh, wording into the file and then print it out. And that's to inform the, the specific violation that, that you see. Correct. Um, they vary from you know people parking on their lawn surface to accumulation of uh, debris and rubbish on a person's property, which is obviously prohibited by the ordinances. So um, in that instance, we upload the photos into the file. The people are given uh, usually eight days is the default to allow for mailing to correct certain violations. Um, Usually for debris and rubbish, uh, I like to give people like two weeks to get it taken care of. Okay, when you say debris and rubbish, you're talking about 
uh, you know, things that may be put to the curb or um, uh, what sorts of debris and rubbish are we talking about? Well, we're looking at, um, a, you know, as defined by the ordinance, it's wood, um, metals, uh, plastics, anything that would normally or should normally be disposed of properly as opposed to being exposed to the weather for, you know, three days or more um, okay. as defined by the ordinance. Certain certain instances such as interior furniture and whatnot, um, that's a separate um, ordinance, okay. so we address that differently. Okay, we, now let's let's talk about that for a second too, because interior furniture is pretty specific. I mean, we're talking about things that were constructed and designed to be used inside a house, right? Um, that you shouldn't have outside, even on a covered porch. An enclosed porch, I suppose, is a little different. Right. But uh, there, there's a difference. And talk a little bit about the inside furniture versus, say, lawn furniture that most people have. So interior furniture um, is prohibited because of the way it weathers as opposed to anything designed for exterior use. Um, couches, dressers, refrigerators, anything of that nature, you know, in excess of three day or 24 hours, I should say, um, isn't allowed because of the nature of the way it weathers. So um, obviously there's a big difference between a plastic chair and an armchair. Mm -hmm. So if it rains or it snows the night prior, um, obviously the armchair is going to become unsightly and that's something the city's trying to avoid. Well, let's talk about that for a little bit too because, uh, you know, Craigslist or curb alerts are, are pretty common. Um, mm -hmm. If I have a piece of furniture, rather than throwing it out or destroying it, um, I may want to see if anybody else can use it. So if I put a, let's say I have a, an armchair uh, that I want to get rid of, I post it online and call it a curb alert, uh, set it out in front of my house with a, a free sign on it. Um, is, is that a violation? Yes. Um, the city prohibits anything from being placed in the right of way okay. um, because it's considered city property and it could potentially pose a hazard to people driving by or in the instance, if it was a refrigerator, if somebody put a free sign on a refrigerator and it's near a school zone and a young child decides they want to play with it or, you know, push it around a little bit and it falls on them. Yeah, yeah th those are much bigger issues. I I'm talking about, you know, what would I be able to do then to, to, to be in compliance, at least for a little bit, to give someone the opportunity to reuse this piece of furniture? Well, I guess in, from our eyes, we give 24 hours to remove it. Okay. Um, you know, I, I guess if you could store it in the garage and have it still posted on Craigslist to have somebody contact you in regards to it or, you know, just get rid of it altogether. If if it's run down and whatever else, we don't want it sitting out there and potentially right. causing a hazard for people. All right, so if I did have that armchair, I could put it on my lawn, uh, not in the boulevard or the right-of-way, but I could put it on my lawn with a free tag on it. And for 24 hours, at least, I would be in compliance, provided it wasn't raining or snowing or something like if that. It's, if it's in the right-of-way, you have 24 hours. If it's up in your, in your property, like on your lawn surface or on your front porch, you get the eight-day grace period okay. to take care of it. And I think that's a big help then, because you know, a lot of people have asked me about that. If they wanted to, I, I would rather see things be reused by someone right. than thrown into the landfill. Sure. Uh, so this gives people an opportunity to do those curb alerts. So I, I appreciate that. What other sorts of things have you have you noticed? A lot of the things that I seem to come across um, quite often since I've started, I've had almost 300 um, between myself and the building inspectors. I would say almost 300 cases for people parking their vehicles on a non-approved surface, whether that be grass, dirt, um, deteriorated gravel, anything that doesn't meet what the ordinance says. Okay. Um, so the ordinance currently says that all vehicles must be parked on an approved hard surface at all times. Okay, tell me what an approved hard surface would be. That would be concrete, asphalt, approved pavers. The pavers would have to be durable enough to maintain the weight of the vehicle. Okay. Um, and, you know, on that side note, people can't just dig up their yard and throw pavers down without having a foundational base so they don't sink into the, to the earth. So that's something we're sure. trying to avoid. Well, and if someone were to do that, they'd still be required to get a permit for that expansion, wouldn't they? I believe so, yes. Okay. Now, um, you know, this is a college town. Mm -hmm. um, I know my daughter's driveway, too, is, is, is gravel. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at moving away from those, those gravel driveways. Can you talk a little bit about what has been accepted and what we're looking at um, and doing in the future regarding uh, the gravel driveways and what people who currently have gravel driveways would and would not be allowed to do? Sure. So as it stands right now, the ordinance says that it, it has to be an approved 
surface, and by approved surface, it's something that's approved, a dustless material approved by the administrator. Mm -hmm. um, the administrator being the city of Stevens Point. In that instance, it would have to be maintained clear of grass and weeds and anything that would um, deteriorate it to the point that would no longer be considered a approved surface. So um, on that token, we're kind of going through you know, ordinance updates and whatnot. So mm -hmm. in, the, in the future here, um, the city is trying to make sure that these gravel surfaces are maintained with a minimum of three inches of mm -hmm. crushed gravel, um, okay. free of vegetative growth and deterioration. If it hits a point that it's beyond um, that approved surface maintaining situation, um, people are going to be required to um, have their driveway updated, um, whether that be concrete asphalt or pavers. Obviously, you know, the city trying to get away from the gravel, we don't want people sure. to go ahead and lay more of it back down. Yeah, well, I know the gravel is, is pretty high maintenance to begin with. Um, every couple of years, you got to bring in a new load and, and, right. and spread it around, and, and there are weeds that come up in there, so those need to be maintained. It's also extremely expensive for someone to asphalt that driveway or, or concrete. Uh, you know, you could be talking about tens of thousands of dollars, so I think it probably makes sense if if you want to have, if you have a driveway that's made with gravel and you want to keep it that way, uh, you have to do some maintenance on it every year just right. to just to be in compliance. Right. So that's good. Good. Um, you know, I know that initially when you started the job, it was pretty overwhelming because, of course, it, it, enforcement wasn't as diligent as it could have been mm -hmm. um, over those years. Uh, so that I suppose there were some challenges there. But I know in the first couple of months, you had sent out over 1,400 letters. Just making people aware that, you know, hey, this building has this wrong with it or, or this is not in compliance. Could you please fix it? Uh, how bad was it for you the first couple of months there? Um, when I first started, it seemed to me like I would never catch up. Mm -hmm. There was that much paperwork and, you know, I was getting phone calls. Every, every time I would come in, you know, people would say, well, I've been doing this for 35 years or 40 years and it's never been an issue. But, you know, with the city taking a new approach, we're kind of, you know, obviously there is going to be a little backlash. I don't want to say backlash, yeah. but a little, um, people little more aware. work yeah. involved. And, and I think what it was is a, a lot of people had always done this and nobody ever had an issue with it. So it, it just kind of got almost swept under the rug. Right. Um, and then making them aware of that, they thought they these were new ordinances, and they're not. We didn't put any new ordinances on the books. We're just making people aware of the ones that had already existed. And I say this periodically, if we could just make a rule that tells everybody to you know, be responsible and get along, I think the city government right. would move a lot right. smoother. But, and, and that's one of the things that I wanted to do. I didn't want to start you know, banging on people's doors and, and forcing them into compliance uh, right away. I, I wanted everybody just to, first of all, education. Be aware of what those ordinances are. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit next, um, is some of the ordinances that we have that you've seen that people, people may not be aware of. And things like general maintenance of the property, uh, sidewalk clearing, um, paint or siding repairs, uh, windows, things like that. So talk about what our current ordinances are and what your experiences have been. You know, a lot of it, like I said earlier, a lot of the stuff that I deal with tends to be a lot of vehicles parking on the lawn, which is prohibited. Um, I've dealt with a number of properties in the city regarding debris and rubbish and any items that would be um, unsightly mm -hmm. basically I think th you know the nature of the ordinance is written to prevent um, blight from occurring and you know if people have items stacked up around their house or in their driveway or you know on their front porch obviously um, given the nature of the way the ordinance is written that's something that the city is trying to prevent so um, you know, in that aspect, it, it all varies. Um, you know, clearing the sidewalks, for example. Mm -hmm. um, given the potential dangerous nature of a snowfall or an ice storm, the city, the city requires the sidewalks to be cleared within 24 hours okay. um, after the end of the snowstorm or ice storm, what have you. Um, if that's not taken care of, our, our office, you know, we receive complaints or we observe it and we send a contractor into the ordinance. Um, and then the property owner is charged the contractor fees and service charge from our office. So, I mean, a lot of the ordinances are all, on, they're all online, mm -hmm. a copy of them. Um, when letters are sent out, property owners are also sent this trifold, 
frequently violated ordinances. Um, and inside, it addresses parking, um, garbage, exterior maintenance violations, and whatnot. So, um, and we can also get a copy of that online as well, right? Uh, StevensPoint.com. This, this trifold mm -hmm. is not online that I'm aware of. Okay, we'll it, it, we'll get it online if it's not online already. Okay, uh, and, and make sure people are aware of that. All of the city ordinances are going to be available online yep. at, at StevensPoint.com. You can click on the ordinances, or if you have a question, just give us a call. We'll be happy to answer that for you. Correct. Uh, tell me about um, again general property maintenance. Uh, you know, paint. I have a wooden sided house. Mm -hmm. um, I like the wood, but paint peeling is a problem for me. So <laughs> unless I'm out there painting it every couple of years, we're going we're gonna to see paint peeling. And honestly, I could paint it and within a couple of weeks, some of it at least has started right, peeling. Right. What, what's the threshold? What do you look for uh, when addressing paint or siding or window issues in a house? So basically, in you know, my experience, my training from, you know, like I said, Jim Zepp and Michael Ostrowski is, is we're looking for something that's obviously becoming an eyesore issue. Um, that being said, we're trying to treat everybody equal, as equal as we can in these regards. If somebody's got three, four pl uh, flakes of paint missing off mm -hmm. of their windowsill, we're obviously not going to address something yeah. like that. If the whole building, on the other hand, is peeling and um, the underlying wood is exposed to the weather, that's something we're obviously wanting to address. And you know, under that ordinance, they can either repaint the structure or um, have it sided. And, you know, that's kind of pretty much up to the property owner sure. as to what they do, sure. you know, whatever's going to be more effective and cost-friendly for them. Okay. Um, it, you know, and, and talk a little bit, too, because some of that property maintenance is pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. um, how willing are we to work with people? If, if people, I kind of look at it from this aspect, if people are willing to communicate with me or our office about needing more time to correct an issue, I'm more than willing to grant them the time they need. I, you know, I know a lot of these aren't overnight fixes, so. Um, well, that says a lot, too. I mean, just, you know, if you get one of these letters, uh, call. If you need some more time to correct it, I think we're, we're more than willing to work with you. It's just that communication needs to be there. Right, uh, right. Between the, the property owners and our offices. Exactly. And, you know, I'm not out to nail everybody for every little thing. It's the main, the main objective of this is voluntary compliance. So we're wanting people to be made aware of the situation and you know that there are some situations where people are saying well you're harassing me and whatever else but if you own a number of properties your you know your chances of getting more of these notices are significantly higher based on um, what was observed so yeah and I want to point out too that we've got a lot of very responsible property owners they take a lot of pride in, in keeping their yard clear of weeds and and things like that um, we're really just trying to inform people that hey we, we've got some standards that we need to deal with here and, and we're hoping that people will once they know of those ordinances that they're really just gonna like you said voluntary compliance right. I think is our goal right um, how about you know spring is coming up here what about uh, lawn maintenance and things like that what are the rules regarding that so um, property owners whether that be Private owners, uh, rental property owners, what have you, are expected to maintain their lawn, including along the right of way around any utility poles, you know, fire hydrants, anything that might be out front of the property, um, in a manner that would prevent grass and weeds from hitting kind of a seven inch threshold is what we're looking at. Okay. So we're not out there with tape measures or no, 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 right, grass no. either. But yeah. I mean, it's pretty obvious if you're not maintaining your lawn properly. Right, and you know, I've had instances where people have said, "Well, this part of my lawn is only so high," but mm -hmm. you know, looking at it from my point of view, if I wait for the rest of the lawn to hit seven inches, the one point you were talking about might hit twelve, and that's something that we're trying to avoid. Yeah. So you might not be hitting that exact seven inch threshold, but you know, I just want to bring it to your attention to make it aware that, hey, you're getting close. So, you know, if you don't correct it, obviously, and it hits that threshold, we, we then assign a contractor who's going to come and um, address the situation. Okay. And what about um, things like lawn ornaments or art um, in your yard or maybe uh, some, some prairie grass? I know there's a lot of people that are trying to get into maintenance-free yards, so they're establishing native plants in their yard. Uh, talk a little bit about that maybe. So as far as the native plantings go, we're kind of looking at having people submit 
plans to uh, community development to have on file in regards to these uh, properties so we kind of know what's going on and why things aren't being obviously cut if we're going with a seven inch threshold for mm -hmm. grass. So we're kind of looking at, like I said, having that documented so if we get complaints or what have you, we have it on file so we can notify the people that are complaining that, hey, you know, we've, we've received a planting layout. Um, they've gone with a natural kind of lawn feel and, you know, we have it here in the office and it's been approved. So um, in that aspect, you know, we're looking for documentation. Um, okay. As far as art goes, that would also be nice to have um, if we could have people uh, do a layout of what they're planning and whatnot. Um, you know, obviously we don't want yards to be cluttered with stuff and uh, somebody well, saying, well, <laughs> this is, you know, this is yeah. just art. Yeah, and a, and a pile of old motors or, or rusty, broken uh, pieces of metal or, or old pallets exactly. doesn't really constitute art. Exactly, yes. So, okay, good, good. Um, are there any other ordinances that you think the general population needs to be aware of? Something that you maybe want to touch on? Um, maybe something uncommon or anything like that? I don't think anything that I have is really um, too out of the ordinary that I come across. Um, you know, I just want to make people aware. I heard a good quote this morning that this is being done not only to help you, but to help your neighbor as well. That's so you have to point. look at it sure. from an aspect of why is the city, why is, you know, the city's not just picking on me. We're, we're working to try and make the overall neighborhood better. Right, and that's really the goal. You know, and I got to tell you a funny story there, too, because there was, you know, I, I'm, I'm not meticulous about my yard, but we need to, you know, mow it every so often, especially during the summer uh, when, when we water it or, or uh, things like that. It grows quickly. Um, I never really cared too much about the, the dandelions. Mm -hmm. um, but we had one guy in our neighborhood who was very meticulous about his yard. Um, sometimes we joke that he'd be out there with scissors trimming it all up so the even height. And he, uh, he weeded it. There was never a dandelion anywhere in his yard. Uh, I remember one time he went and uh, did some weeding in the neighbor's yard. <laughs> We're all friends in my neighborhood. Sure, sure. And he went over there and he, he picked up, uh, pulled all the dandelions out of his yard so that the, the seeds wouldn't blow into, into Quinn's yard. Uh, but it really did kind of inspire some of us in the neighborhood to try and take a little more care of our yards. Sure. Um, and I went over to him for advice and, you know, what do you use for fertilizer? What do you use for, you know, natural weed control or, or natural bug control? Um, and he was more than happy to give advice to anyone in his neighborhood. So that's really, I think, uh, a, a, a nice side effect mm -hmm. of this enforcement and just awareness is that, it, you know, it, it lets people know that, hey, my neighbor's doing something nice and you kind of want to do something nice to, to fix up your yard. And uh, it really creates a nice environment in all of the neighborhoods. Uh, so I think everybody wins. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, we're, we're getting close to out of time, but I want to talk about some of the follow-up that we're doing because this is relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you've been uh, here for several months already and I want to start getting some feedback on it other than the phone calls that we get periodically, you and I. Sure. Uh, and I know that other people in your office get those phone calls too, and we yes. deal with those. Yes. We, we explain what we do. Uh, but what I'm doing uh, now is I'm trying to do some, some outreach. So I'm meeting with a few groups uh, to get their feedback, uh, specifically the apartment owners uh, association and some neighborhood districts, to, s to get feedback on how things are going. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I don't want to get to the point where we are nitpicking in neighborhoods. Uh, and I think I told you this. I mean, the ultimate goal is for you to drive around and see nothing that warrants a a letter and you come back to the office with a smile on your face yep and everybody's happy so uh, over the next couple of weeks I'm going to be having those meetings take some feedback on how the program's going maybe some ways to improve it um, or maybe some ways to uh, to expand upon it uh, so if anybody has any feedback that they'd like to share uh, my office is always available you can get me through the city website at stevenspoint.com uh, uh, Facebook Twitter uh, any number of, of ways. I'm probably the most accessible person in the city at this point. And uh, thank you for your time, and we'll see you the next time.